the show for the nerd inclined, as we'd like to say. I'm Andrea yeah. Renee, joined by Christine Steimer. Hi, I'm here. It's just I'm us like, this week. I was, I was about to say, I'm the only one here. <laughs> so, um, as you guys know, if you watched the show or listened to the show last week, Brittany is now officially on her way to get hitched. Well, she technically got married in the States in a courthouse ceremony, but her ceremony is, her official, like, romantic ceremony is happening uh, in a tropical place, so she won't be with us. But um, we're very happy for her. But Alexa yes. Ray is once again not feeling well, so we are going to be holding down the ship without her, which means that Steimer and I are going to nerd out over Destiny 2 in the hands-on segment. But uh, before we get to that, we are going to talk about some news because some cool stuff happened this week. So, Steimer, yeah. um, there was a gigantic Nintendo Direct this week. Today. Well, yeah. today, uh, recording of this podcast. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, so Nintendo hasn't done a, uh, I think probably E3 was the last time they had an information dump as large as what happened at the direct. This <laughs> sounds week. so gross. What, information dump? <laughs> yeah, I don't like it. <laughs> <laughs> well, there was a lot of stuff that happened, okay? There uh, was. You can think of a classier way to say it if you would like. How would you prefer to say it? <laughs> Information overload. <laughs> I don't know. Just not the word dump. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, so some of the biggest announcements that came out of the Direct um, were some new titles coming to Nintendo Switch. So Bethesda has announced that they are bringing not only Skyrim to switch as we already knew but they're bringing mm -hmm. wolfenstein to the new colossus and they're bringing doom what do you think about that simer the doom do do doom those are games i would not want to play on the switch but i good for them like i'm just glad that nintendo is working nicely with third parties so that's that's my takeaway from this is like gg good job guys yeah i think it's excellent i think it bodes well for fans of Bethesda and for owners of a Switch who would like to see more offerings than just Nintendo first party games. Um, I did have the opportunity to play Skyrim and Doom on the Switch, but my impressions are embargoed. So uh. we will get those on the show for you next week. So make sure you tune back in for my impressions on those. But um, there was a lot of other things that happened as well. We found out uh, release dates for a bunch of stuff. So, as I mentioned, Skyrim is coming on November 17th. Resident Evil Revelations and Revelations 2 are coming on November 28th. And Doom is just holiday 2017. Um, we did also get a date for Xenoblade Chronicles 2. Alexa Ray, not so excited for that game. Um, if you guys missed her impressions on that last week's episode, she talked about it at length. Uh, the game is coming out on December 1st. And then Lost Fear which uh, they talked about as well, January 23rd, 2018. So those are some dates for you. Then we also found out about Kirby Star Allies coming in spring 2018 and Dragon Quest Builders coming in 2018. I think Dragon Quest was a no-brainer title. I'm really glad to see that that's coming to Switch. Did you ever play that on, on console, Steimer? I'm not a Dragon Quest person. Not that I don't like it. I just have never really gotten into the series. Um, that being said, I want to jump back to Kirby really quick. What did you think? Because it was not what I was expecting. And I'm a little bit disappointed. Why are you disappointed? I mean, I guess for me, I have no expectations for Kirby games. So I was like, oh, it's another Kirby game. Cool. I don't know. It just <laughs> seemed almost too kiddish for me. Like in the sense of it just was like moving pretty slowly and like. I don't necessarily want to play Kirby with other people. It's not not why I play Kirby. I just kind of want another Dreamland-ish game. Yeah. Um, and granted, maybe I should. I, mean, I won't judge this until I get to play it. Like, But I don't know. As I was looking at it, I was like, oh. That was kind of my thought was just, oh. <laughs> like, was, well, like, oh okay. Yeah, that's not a great thought if it's just like, hey, cool. But I mean... I think it's good to see some other Nintendo franchises uh, coming to Switch besides just, you know, Zelda and Mario. Mario. Obviously, there's a Pokemon game in the works, but we don't know. We don't have specifics on, on that yet. That was um, noticeably missing, but I guess they're waiting to talk about the Switch version because they did talk about Ultra Sun and Ultra Moon. Did you play either of those for 3DS? No. I have not played a Pokemon game in a while, admittedly, but... 
I do think no matter, no matter, even if it's just like regular old Pokemons in a new shiny skin, I'll play the Switch version um, because I am now obsessed with it. <laughs> Your Nintendo Switch? <laughs> my, my Nintendo Switch. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, it's pretty great. I think, I mean, they, they didn't say anything here because they barely said anything at E3. I just think that game is too far out to really have anything to talk about. Yeah, that's probably true. Um, but they did talk about Project Octopath Traveler. So I this thought this a, looked so cool. Yeah, so this is an interesting game. So it's set to release in 2018. Um, now, this isn't the final name, apparently, because um, Square Enix, when they posted this trailer, um, they said it's being made by the staff behind the Bravely series. And on top of that, um, if you guys want to check it out, there is a free demo that apparently is out now with two player characters to choose from. And uh, the game is set for a world simultaneous worldwide worldwide release, so Japan won't be getting this game ahead of the West or other territories. But um, they didn't give a specific release date. So, what was it about this game that really intrigued you when you saw the art. this footage? Well, the art? I mean, any any game, the first thing you see is obviously the art style, and I thought this was neat because essentially it's two D sprites in a three D world. So I just really enjoyed. Um, the dichotomy between those two styles and then for me as i've as i've talked about before jrpgs are like my jam on a on a to-go console so the fact that it's coming to switch makes me really happy and i don't know why that is but for me there's just something about playing a jrpg on a smaller screen that <laughs> it's like it doesn't really make any logical sense but that's where i prefer to play it uh, and i thought it was interesting that what they were I didn't quite understand it, and I think I might actually download this demo and and play around with the battle system because it just seemed sort of like a regular turn-based system. But then there was something about um, boosts or there was some special thing. You're supposed to get the timing right, and then it theoretically makes you super more powerful if you're good at it, which hopefully I will be. Um, but the other thing I thought was interesting is that so you can download this demo, and then they're going to send out a survey and like get players' feedback on this game. And I, I thought wonder, that was pretty fascinating. So from your perspective, having worked at a developer, how far along in the process do you think they are that they could potentially incorporate community feedback? Yeah, that's the one part where it's going to depend. If the, if this game releases in like early 2018, I doubt anything except maybe like, here's what you should call it. <laughs> because if it's not Octopus, yeah. which is what I like to call it, it's not called Octopus, but Octopath, um, octopath but Octopus. Um, and so... If, but if it's coming out late 2018, there is a chance that they could tweak minor thing, you know, things with the code, um, like combat or whatever. I don't know what exactly they would be looking to change, though. So I, I, I'm not sure yet. I need to download it and kind of mess around. There's only one way to find out. You play the demo, you take the survey, and we find out what they're asking. True. But yeah, I just found that really curious because I haven't seen, even in, in betas that they have now, which are really glorified demos because they're too, those are too soon to release to really make any difference except for on the server end. Um, this one has the potential to really take feedback and do something with it. What that is, I don't know. Maybe they'll do nothing, but there's an opportunity for sure. All right. Well, we will have to report back to you guys once we learn a little bit more about that game. Um, some other things that we found out from the uh, Nintendo Direct, a new Nintendo 2DS XL that looks like a Pokeball. Really cute. So, so I don't know how I feel about this new uh, Nintendo 2DS XL. It looks a lot like a 3DS, but it just doesn't have the 3D effect, right? Like that's this clap shell, it's basically clap shell, clam a, shell one. Yeah, it's basically, I think, what, just a regular DS, but bigger. Yeah, that but would make yes, sense. But no, but no 3D, so they have to call it 2D, which is weird, because <laughs> the naming conventions on these things are just like, I don't even know at this point, just call it whatever. But, I mean, I personally don't, granted, it is smaller than my Switch, but at the same time, I kind of don't really understand why you would need both. You wouldn't. You would definitely just spend no. your money to buy a Switch, is yeah. what, what I would think. But uh, there are the the library, obviously, on 3DS and 2DS is 
much astronomically bigger. bigger than a Switch. So that could potentially be the one major selling point is like if there's a bunch of 3DS games that you want to play that you obviously can't play on Switch until Nintendo one day brings virtual console to the Switch. We're all Please for out. the love of God. We're all holding out hope. Oh, because they announced some arcade games for the Switch today, yeah, too. Yeah, that was really cool. So the original Mario Brothers arcade cabinet, that game is going to be coming in something Nintendo is calling the Arcade Archives um, to Nintendo Switch. And it wasn't just that game. There were several other games that they announced will be also coming. Um, I thought that, that was a really interesting idea. I'm not sure I want to play that game. Yeah, I would really rather just have the virtual console. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I, but, like, I like the idea of you know taking the joy cons off and turning them on their side and kind of using them as like a like a little mini um joystick mm-hmm. but they're so small those joy cons that i don't yeah i don't know how that's gonna work using them on their side is not super comfortable as we have learned while playing mario kart with one joy con each Raptor and you claw. get the hand yeah <laughs> it's just like ow even my tiny hands i'm like ow yeah, so I guess we'll have to do a little playtesting with that. But um, what did you think about those new Zelda Breath of the Wild champion amiibos? See, I'm not an amiibo person. Yeah, not even <laughs> to have like as like a collectible toy. No, I have no toys in my house. Well, that's not entirely true. I have like, <laughs> I have a few plushies, um, and that's it. Like I've gotten rid of most of my gaming statues and or lost them. As I think oh. I talked about on a, like, I, I lost my, I can't say the name of it, Kota Bakuya, something like that. My Mass Effect statues where they had Commander Shepard and. Oh, yeah, you told uh, me about that. Leara. I think I said that on the Patreon stream. And I, re- and I realized in that stream that I was missing them. Like, that's how much I did not notice. And then I was like, wait a minute. I spent money on those. Where'd they go? <laughs> You crack you crack me up. Obviously, I have an abundance of toys here at the studio. Right. If As I a, had a studio, I would definitely decorate it. But I'm just one of the, I'm in the mood now where like in my actual house, quote unquote, area. I don't want too much obvious gaming things. I enjoy art. You like, like being a closet gamer. Yeah, a little bit. <laughs> yet yeah, there comes a time when you have to, as an adult, decide, okay, I need to like classy the place up a bit so that's why i ended up getting some really amazing video game art from i am 8-bit so they're a fantastic resource if you're a gamer out there that loves displaying your game gaming love unlike steimer who's a classic gamer um, <laughs> i highly recommend checking out some of the art that they have at i am 8-bit.com uh, it's a great group of people who run that organization they do all kinds of cool stuff I've gotten a couple of really good pieces there. They do prints of most of their art, so they're actually really affordable. So, um, yeah. Um, okay, so I didn't mean to get sidetracked there. Uh, we were talking good. about Nintendo Direct. Um, is there yes. anything else here that you would like to talk about? Did we mention the bundle? Oh, the oh Mario? no, we totally didn't. Good call, okay. Stime Time. So <laughs> Nintendo announced, I tweeted about this too, Nintendo announced a Nintendo Switch Super Mario Odyssey bundle that comes with the red Joy-Cons and a digital code for Super Mario Odyssey. And a sweet, sweet case. Yeah, and it comes with a carrying case as well. So this is going to be probably the hot ticket item at Christmas this year. I can almost see it already. I don't think Nintendo um, is going to give nearly enough units for how many people probably want to buy this thing. Um, I think it's really neat. Obviously, I have a Switch already, so I can't buy the bundle. But if I saw it, it would be a really fun gift to give someone who didn't have a Switch. Um, What did you think about the Super Mario Odyssey footage that they showed? I only caught um, like the tail end of it where I think they were talking about Something moons. What did, what did they call them? Power moons? Yes. So that's what unlocks like the next world. So your Odyssey, which is, I don't think I understood before that the Odyssey is the name of your ship. So you have a, a little like, it's, it's like a, it's not quite like a spaceship. It looks, it looks like, like a sailing, like a sailboat, but in the sky, but it looks like a top hat. So it's like a hat ship a top hat sail ship it's a weird thing but it's called the odyssey so hence super mario odyssey and then you take your ship between worlds and in order to get enough fuel to go between the worlds you have to 
uh, collect these power moons and then they're hidden throughout the world and they did a really nice job of kind of overtly saying hey some of these are going to be real obvious in your face but a lot of them you're really going to have to search to find they're hidden very well throughout the world and that of course is very very mario to hide out objects and to have to find the secret levels and figure out like the back door way into collecting these items so i th- when i was watching this gameplay trailer the thing that came to mind immediately was one oh my gosh this looks incredible this is the mario game that i've been waiting for i've been dying for um super mario galaxy 3 and i think this is i think this is that game two Oh my gosh, I can't believe Nintendo has two gigantic Game of the Year contenders released in the same calendar year. Yeah, that's true. To think about Breath of the Wild going up against Super Mario Odyssey for potential Game of the Year contention is crazy because Nintendo's never done that before. And I think that that is excellent. I have been a vocal critic of some of the missteps Nintendo has taken over the last couple of years, but I think that they are doing a really fantastic job this year with game releases and hardware. And on top of that, they announced they're bringing the NES Classic back. Hell yeah. Well, I don't really care, but hell yeah to everybody who wants it. (laughs) So um, in addition to saying that they're bringing the NES Classic back in 2018, which... um, they said in a release today, they didn't. They said it's going to be in a limited supply in a very short window. But they also said that there will be um, plenty of Super NES Classic editions. So the SNES they talked about earlier in the week, saying there will be more items of SNES Classic Edition at launch in stores than there were the entire run of NES Classic Edition. Oh. So, so that's a really good thing for fans of Nintendo who have been trying to get their hands on that little guy who didn't manage to get a pre-order. Reggie came out and made a statement and was trying to reassure Nintendo fans, hey, we are going to put as many of these in stores as possible. The, the one thing that is kind of up in the air is what does that number mean? Because Nintendo never released the sales figures for the NES Classic Edition. They never said this is how many units we shipped. So we don't mm-hmm. know if that means it's 100,000 units or if it's... 300,000 units or more. Maybe it's more. Um, we just don't know. So it. I think that that's good, though. I think it's the right move that Reggie came out and made a statement about it. And, and if you guys missed the NES Classic Edition and don't want to pay a reseller on eBay or whoever, you know, triple the price, they're bringing it back. So just hang on to your dollars and hopefully you can get one as part of the limited run when they come out in 2018. So Yay, Nintendo doing nice things. Yeah. Speaking of... Uh, so another, this is more minor, obviously, but since we had talked about this previously on the podcast, I saw that they have fixed their voice chat app, and now you can still chat even if it your phone goes to sleep or you switch out of the app. Praise Jeebus! It's about time. Like, yeah, I'm like, hey, basic functionality, get! <laughs> <laughs> I mean, and this is why they've made it free, right? Because they need yeah. to work out these kinks and figure out what the community wants as far as feature sets go. Because Nintendo is not the greatest at online connectivity, so I'm glad that they're working out some of those, um, some of those bugs, as it were. Mm-hmm. All right. So I think that's probably enough Nintendo news for the moment. Did yes. I miss anything? I- um... Not that I can recall, but there was a lot today. But I think we hit the major things. Oh, yeah. Mario and Luigi, Superstar Saga, and Bowser's Minions. I forgot about that. That game is coming out on October 6th. That's a 3DS remake. And then there's also Radiant Historia Perfect Chronology. That's coming from Atlas with a... There was a new English voice story trailer out this week. That's coming out in early 2018. And then there's um, Etrian Odyssey 5 Beyond the Myth. Is set to release next month, and a free demo is available now on the eShop. Okay. So, next story. So, in addition to Nintendo having a big event this week, Apple also had a big event this week. They, of course, unveiled their new iPhone 8 and the iPhone X. I hate calling it the iPhone 10 because I feel like Why? it's dumb that they announced the iPhone 8 and then the iPhone 10 and they're just skipping 9. But somebody oh. also pointed out to me that Windows jumped from 8 to 10. And I'm like, well, but they didn't announce Windows 8 and Windows 10 in the same press conference. <laughs> right? 
True. Is this a true. stupid thing for me to be mad about, Steimer? I mean, a little bit because they're doing ten because it's tenth anniversary. Okay, that's that why. Kind of makes and, sense. And it's an X because it's Roman numeral ten. <laughs> I just think it's dumb. I don't think they've. <laughs> I mean, a lot of the things they said during that conference were dumb. Let's be real. We're not calling them retail stores. We're calling them town halls or whatever the hell. Town squares. <laughs> Sorry, town squares. <laughs> I was like, are you, I just, my eyes could not roll harder. <laughs> Apple is pretty far up its own ass. But, you know, I I love Apple products. So, I mean, who I I freely criticize them, but I've spent thousands of dollars on Apple products over oh, the course same. of my life. So, I'm like same. literally holding my Apple laptop right now. So. iPhone. Although this is a super old one. This is like three years old at this point. Well, hey, that's a testament to how good of a piece of hardware it is. It still works. So this is the sentiment that I've seen from everybody across the interwebs this week as everyone is coming out on Facebook and Twitter and saying, my iPhone still works great. I have no need to upgrade. And I would say that too. I said I got the iPhone 7 when I upgraded last and I think it works great. I have no desire to upgrade to the 8 or the 10. I think that they are outrageously expensive. The I think Apple is really trying to set a new bar and saying, hey, guess what? You want our newest best thing? It's going to cost you at minimum a thousand dollars. Well, that's for the X. But yeah, the other ones are still very expensive. The other ones, I think, are only a couple hundred dollars less than that. The, the iPhone 8s. Um, and yeah, I mean, but cell phones are always expensive. Here's the part that's... Uh, Strange to me, though, because I have grown up with the traditional method of every two years you trade your old phone in and then they give you like the new one for like 200 bucks or something. Right. And you're basically renewing your contract and that they and I guess the carrier would just eat the cost of the rest of the phone. Which they and should because they already make enough money off of us. <laughs> exactly. But now no one's doing that anymore. And so you have to pay the whole cost either up front or in monthly installments. And for me, this because this last phone I got like the old traditional way, which great old phone in, pay $200, get the new phone, yay. Um, and so now I'm not quite sure what the hell to do because <sighs> I don't want to do the monthly plan. Because I'm averse to them. <laughs> but I also don't want to pay like $800 out of pocket at once. That's a lot of money. I'm about to move, hopefully, knock on wood. And um, I, I really can't just drop that kind of money. But I also do need a new phone. Um, well, need is an overstatement. Need, maybe not. Want, yes. I and we all want the newest hot piece of tech but as you mentioned it is it is very very pricey so i think what's interesting is that iphone in particular is a device that really never goes down in price uh, every time i've tried to look for like discounted iphones the only time you can really get them cheaper than their you know msrp is if you're buying a refurbished one or if you're buying a used phone the price just doesn't drop <laughs> ever it doesn't matter yeah. if you're paying it monthly or you're paying it all up at once or if you're leasing like i am um you're still paying for it <laughs> it's it's yep. always gonna cost you no matter what you do so yeah so i've still yet to figure that out but i have until friday <laughs> there you go <laughs> which is when the iphones go for the eight the eights go on pre-order the 10 is like october and that's the other thing we're like i don't really want to wait till the end of october to pre-order something. Screw that. Yeah. Screw I, that. I really just want the better cameras. I'm yeah. being completely honest. The cameras are great, I will say. But uh, I don't want to get too far in the weeds talking about the iPhone. The reason why we brought this up is because there was a big gaming announcement that happened That's at right. the Apple event this week. So uh, the next game from that game company we found out is called Sky, and it's coming first to Apple TV, iPhone, and iPad. So company head Genova Chen took to the stage during the iPhone event to show off the adventure title for the t first time. It's reminiscent of that game company's breakout hit Journey in that it combines exploration with a light social experience. Players will fly through the clouds in order to collect light from around the world, controlling a mysterious cloaked figure. Sky will have online multiplayer support for up to eight players worldwide. And Chen said, 
or Chen said during the presentation. He also noted that the game will only be available on Apple's three platforms. So it's an Apple exclusive, iPhone, iPad, and Apple TV, the latter of which will soon support 4K resolution. And based on the footage that they showed on stage, Sky looks like it will benefit from that upgrade. So when the developer teased this project early last year, they said only that it was a game about giving. Prior to that hint, the studio announced that it had begun development on a new project after raising more than $7 million in equity to do so back in 2014. So what's interesting about this is that we know, we've obviously known that that game company has been working on something. I have to say, I did not expect it to be an Apple exclusive. Do you think this is indicative of where Apple's plans are to go in the gaming market? I have no idea. <laughs> like, it, this was a surprise to me too. And they were like, and now, you know, Chen from that game company. I was like, wait, I'm sorry, what? <laughs> um, and I mean, it makes sense. I guess, yeah, $7 million. Did that all come from Apple? Like, I'm, it was, it was just like money bags McGee over here. Like, here you go. Um, I think it's interesting. And I think they're also, Apple's also kind of like exploring the market of, uh, TV content a la Netflix or um, another thing that I can't think of right now. <laughs> Hulu? But, yeah. Yeah, Hulu. Um, so so they're, you know, creating their own original content too. And so now I guess they're also maybe messing around with different gaming experiences. I think they really do try and they want to be a real platform. Um, and I guess this is the way to do it. I'm curious. I'm I'm on the fence about this game because I love that game company games, but I, I, I don't know if I want to play it with like a little, the little, uh, what the hell, the little remote from the Apple TV or even on my phone. I don't know. It's one of those things where I'm like, I need to play this. I need to get my hands on this and see how this feels because as a traditional gamer, I typically don't like super touchscreen oriented games. Um, they just feel like tap fests usually. Yeah, I guess it really depends on what the game is and how um, intense the control schemes are. I have I I enjoy mobile games that are specifically designed for glass. Uh, I don't really like the controller simulations that some games have, where they'll have like the little joystick and then the buttons on the other side of the screen that you're just kind of using touch controls for, but. Telltale, for example, those kinds of games are really easy and excellent to play on an iPad, and they fit really well. And there's obviously several other games. Like, did you ever play Monument Valley on iPhone? No, I, it's, it's one of the ones that I looked at, and I that is a game that I would play. I just don't. I just don't really play games on my phone. Yeah, well, I really only play games on my iPad when I'm traveling, like when I'm flying. But now I have my Switch. <laughs> I was gonna say, but that, that's what I had my Vita before, and now I have my Switch. And I just, personally, it's not what I want to play on, but I do think that there are good games on it. Yeah. So, and I think this looks like it could be one of them. Well, there are plenty of third-party peripherals that you could use actual like game pads uh, on your devices. And I have to imagine that Apple is going to be working with someone to put out some kind of a game pad-like device for Apple TV if this is the route that they're going down. Uh, but I-, <laughs> I can't wait to hear their bullshit marketing name for it. <laughs> What do you? Oh yeah, it would be like what? I don't know. What they call it the air, No, they couldn't call it the AirPad. That doesn't sound right. The Apple uh, Pad. The no, that doesn't sound right either. Because iPad, shit. Um, the Air Controller. The i i controller. I, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. But I can't. Well, come on, Apple. Show us what you got. We yeah. are curious. But hey, the good news is it might be white or space gray. Or rose gold. <laughs> they sold probably, colored controllers. Ooh, rose gold would be pretty. Make it happen, Apple. Give us a rose gold <laughs> controller. We'll buy all the games you make. <laughs> <laughs> like, that's the only reason why. That's the only way I'll play your iPhone games or your iPad games, your Apple TV games. So, so easily really swayed by something pink. <laughs> yes. Okay. Um, one more piece of news before we um, head into our big Destiny 2 dump of information. Um, No, stop using that word. (laughs) ah, Sorry. Uh, Our Destiny explosion. Yes. So this week, a little bit of sad news for Naughty Dog fans. Bruce Straley, the co-director of The Last of Us and Uncharted 4, is officially leaving Naughty Dog following an extensive sabbatical. So over on Kotaku, they have his statement. It reads... 
After heading up three extremely demanding projects and taking some extended time away from the office, I found my energy focusing in other directions, and I slowly realized this was the signal that it's time to move on. <clears throat> so that was um, the statement that he wrote on Naughty Dog's website. So last week, Kotaku reported that Straley would not be co-directing The Last of Us 2 with his longtime creative partner, Neil Druckmann. So he's apparently taken nearly a year off from working at Naughty Dog, and that's when he decided to not return to the studio. So he's been work- he had been working there for 18 years, working on everything from Crash Team Racing to Uncharted. So, Steimer, what do you yeah. make of this news? It's not surprising to me. Um, it's sad, but it's not sad for the reasons you might think. Like, I think this is sad because it's clear to me that this industry has a problem with crunch and overtime and burning people out and burning good people out. Like, the Bruce hasn't been back since the end of since they wrapped Uncharted Four, uh, and I don't blame him. Like, and especially I think there was something. Um, I think it was on Kotaku that I read that he had to get a second apartment in order to work more because the the drive was taking to, I don't know where he lives, but somewhere else in LA. Uh, And so he got like a second apartment near the office so that he could just live there. And I'm like, this dude has a family. So I don't blame him for being, for taking the year off, realizing his priorities were probably not aligned with where he's at in life and making a change. Like, I think that that's, that's good of him to realize it's sad for the industry because he's really talented and he's worked on a lot of great stuff and him and Neil make a great team. Um, but at the same time, I don't think anybody can fault him for, for wanting to have more balance in his life. And I think it's something that it should be a wake up call like to the industry. Hello, like please stop burning out all of our really talented, amazing people because you want to keep these folks around. Like they make good stuff. Yeah. Crunch is an interesting and unfortunate part of the business. I know that people who work on the development side have varying opinions of crunch and its importance to the development process. But did he say that crunch was the reason why he left or that like I don't he think got he burned said out? specifically, but I mean, come on. Like he said three back to back demanding projects. And I've, you know, heard rumblings or whatever from internal like that crunch was really bad. Um, so I mean, that's to take it with what it is. That's that would be my projection on onto this thing. <laughs> I think it's interesting that he took such a long sabbatical and then decided to quit. To me, that that makes sense. Like, because if you if you're really that burned out and then having that space away and if you're realizing you don't have the desire to go back, then then don't. And I, and I think that that's a good move. So, you know, I know, whereas I know other people who they take a break and then they immediately have that desire to go back and like, they want to get back to work and that is fine too, you know, do whatever floats your boat. But it's clear that his internal, um, dialogue was like not into it anymore. And I think that's totally fair. Yeah. Well, you know what? We want to say thank you, Mr. Straley for, All of the work that you did at Naughty Dog, we as gamers are better off for the work that you and the rest of the team at Naughty Dog has made. Um, Take whatever time you need and hopefully you can get back to doing something creative that energizes you. So um, thanks from all of us who love Naughty Dog games. Yeah, which is pretty much everybody. (laughs) Yeah, pretty much everybody. Um, All right. So that will do it for the news for this week. Um, we have lots of Destiny 2, not only news, but chatter about our time playing the game and everything else you could want to know about what's happening with that, with that, um, game coming up right after the break. So stay with us. We will be right back. This episode of the What's Good Games podcast is brought to you by TakeThis.org. Hey, listen, everyone struggles to feel good sometimes. Feeling depressed after a breakup or anxious about a job interview is part of life. And for some people, those feelings never really go away or they get worse over time. If that sounds like you or someone you know, you're not alone. And there's help. At TakeThis.org, our friends at Take This have collected advice and articles from mental health workers and other people who've been there. From advice on how to find a therapist to when to know it's time to get help. TakeThis.org is a treasure trove of information about your brain and what to do when it hurts. 
Take This has been working to bring the mental health care community and the video game community together since 2012. If you or someone you love could use some perspective, visit them at takethis.org. And if you have the resources to donate or volunteer, takethis.org is where you do that too. It's dangerous to go alone. Take this. What's good, everybody? Welcome back to the What's Good Games podcast. So Steimer and I are here holding down the fort, ready to talk about all things Destiny 2. I think it kind of makes sense that you and I are here this week so we can chat about it because I know that Alexa Ray has not been playing. And I know that Brittany has only played a little bit uh, before she had to run off to her tropical vacation. So let's talk about Destiny 2. So for let's everybody... Who's going to be listening? There will be some mild spoilers. I really don't think talking about what happens in the Destiny 2 campaign is really too spoilery because it's all pretty predictable, especially if you played any of the original Destiny, any of the expansions. It's not like the lore is like a big secret. It's not like we're giving away some kind of crazy ending. Would you? And agree it's also with that? like it's like every video game ever created. <laughs> it's like it's not like it does anything in the sense of story wise, like you will not be shocked and appalled at the ending, I think. Correct. Yeah, I agree. So, um, Steimer, mm -hmm. we finished the campaign together. We did. Thank you, did you for do? your assistance. <laughs> no, no problem. Hey, it's a, it's <gasps> admittedly tough to do alone. It's possible, but it's more fun and easier, not so stressful when you have a fire team with you. So what did you think of the story? So, here, here's my thing. I have, I have mixed feelings about Destiny right now. On one hand, I see it being very similar to my first experience with Destiny a few years ago when it launched. Um, and that, but two, like I do still like playing it at least at this point. So I'm not trying to say this is a terrible game. Don't ever play it. Blah blah blah. But at the same time, I'm feeling deja vu, and. I'm a little concerned I'm going to have the exact same nope experience at a very similar time as I did with the first Destiny. Um, the story was better in the sense that it was better constructed. The missions had better variants. I was more interested in them because they focused on the, uh, what would you call them? Like your senpais. <laughs> uh, the, the Vanguard? Yeah, sure. Is that what the three the three fire team main guys yeah. are? Mm -hmm. Um so so I liked basically working with them. Obviously Kate Six, Nathan Fillion. Amazing. Like just if they just made a spin-off game where it was just him, I'd play it. <laughs> like, that would be excellent. Yeah. Everybody wants to be a hunter anyway, right? Yeah, Nathan. well Coolest. maybe not maybe not in Destiny Two, which we'll go into in a bit, but uh continue. Um, well, that was kind of it. Like, so, but yeah, like there's, there was a decent variance. It wasn't too, I was a little bit nervous that it was going to be a really long campaign for some reason. Uh, it was not. And then the best part was I finished the story at level 18 and then I immediately went, oh crap, I'm going to have to grind to get those last two levels are you kidding me right now it's like the last thing i want to do right i was just trying to get into a strike with you and then um stupidly did not go and keep following like the little story things around the tower Ooh. oops <laughs> i shouldn't probably have said Until that i was like hey steimer <laughs> <laughs> and then you were like hey um you can you can go talk to so and so, and I was like, really? And then I was like, you didn't do anything. And then I, but then I actually followed like the quest line, and then it worked, and it auto dinged me to twenty. And I look at was that, so excited. <laughs> you so really excited. just you really just wanted your sparrow, right? That's what it I was. wanted. This I just wanted to, because here's the thing: the journey from zero to twenty is meaningless. Like, there's nothing. Nothing great happens there. I mean, just the story, right? Like, that's the only thing you're doing throughout that time. Um, and then once you hit 20, that's when the real game begins. And I just kind of wanted to get to the real game. <laughs> and now you're there. So I am there. I thought the story was better than Destiny. But I think that they have a long way to go as far as making a campaign. But clearly, you know, the, the story missions are just one part of Destiny. 
as you mentioned, the real work in Destiny begins after you finish the campaign. So I encourage people who are playing, if you haven't bothered finishing the main story missions, first off, stop delaying. Just run through the campaign because once you hit level 20, everything really unlocks for you in a pretty meaningful way. You get access to a lot more interesting things. Um, most notably, I would say, is the Strike playlist, which is excellent. I don't know why they chose to not put the strikes inside the story of Destiny 2 the way they did in Destiny. I personally would have preferred that. But um, I'm glad that they're there and they're really fun and they provide a nice gameplay challenge. Um, once you get your power level high enough, the Nightfall is really awesome. It was one of the best pieces of endgame content in the original Destiny is getting your fire team together and running the Nightfall every week. And the raid went live this week. So uh, as of the time of us recording this... Um, Somebody has successfully finished the raid and I'm going to be streaming the raid um, on twitch.tv slash what's good game. So if you guys missed the stream, you can head there and check out our archive or you can also find it on youtube.com slash what's good games. If you guys are subscribed over there, uh, we're not going to probably do the whole raid because it's long, <laughs> but we'll get through as many checkpoints as we can. And, um, you know, we'll try Wait, are you to doing that tomorrow or when are you doing that? Yeah. Oh, I can't do it with you. Why not? Because I'm too low. Oh, well, that's that sounds like a you problem, Steiner. <laughs> well, I guess I'm not streaming with you because I'm only like power level 220. You know what the good news is, though, Steiner? As soon as you are ready to run Nightfall and run the raid, we can do it all again because that's the beauty of Destiny. And we have an amazing What's Good Guardians Destiny clan. Uh, it filled up quite quickly. So apologies to anybody who's looking to get in. Hopefully somebody in the community will start a second um, what's good guardians like what's good guardians part two or something um what's good guardians dose that's yeah my, dose that's i like what it. i want it to be called yeah um we do have some xbox players in the clan but it's predominantly ps4 right now and i know that once pc goes live we'll need to get a separate clan for pc players going as well but the clan rewards have kicked in a couple of days ago so once we max out our rewards we will all be able to get Engrams, which I think is a really nice um, token for people to be incentivized to go and do these clan activities, which is really cool. Um, they also put guided games live. So I have a little beta token that I can use to go and check out a guided game, which I haven't done yet. But I really love the idea of guided games and the concept of sherpa people through certain things. Um, when I was on Games Daily earlier this week, we got a question from somebody about, you know, it. do I need to be a specific level to be sherpa through something? Do I have to do this? Can somebody just kind of like carry me through? And to that, I had said, you know, guided games is specifically for people who have put the time in to get their power level where it needs to be, but they don't have people to play with. It isn't or the knowledge of like how it how works. it works exactly. It isn't necessarily so that they can boost your power level because. If you're not the right power level, for the recommended power level for the event or the activity you're going into, um, it makes it tough for everybody else that you're with. And certain um, activities won't even let you go into those, won't even let your fire team access those if you're not the right level. So I'd say, you know, if you're going to adventure into guided games, kind of keep that in the back of your mind. Make sure that you've been grinding like everybody else has to make sure that you're the right um, power level. Um, yeah, it's it's not like a win button for you. You're not supposed to just sit there and like let everybody do all the work while you chill in the back. I don't think that's the way a raid has ever worked in Destiny, nor should it. No, definitely not. I mean, there has been certain areas where I was on the very like minimum of the recommended power uh, for raids, and I kind of had to be carried because you get in previous Destiny, you got to a point where you the grinding wasn't giving you high enough level gear in order to get your level up to where you needed it. You needed to have a piece of raid gear. And the only way to get raid gear is to do the raid. Um, so it's kind of like a chicken and the egg thing a little bit. Yeah. But it, they've tweaked that now because clearly many people were over power level 290 when the raid was released this week. And that recommended level is 260 to 280. And... I haven't played it yet. I haven't watched anything about it yet. I'm very excited to jump into it. But my experience with the raids tells me that even though there's a minimum recommended power, you probably want to be a little bit over that because otherwise it's going to be real challenging for you. 
Um, but what are you most excited about checking out now that you've finished the campaign and the rest of Destiny 2 has opened up? Um, well, I mean, Destiny for me has always been about playing with friends. It's never been anything more than that because to me, I still don't think they quite have the legs that another multiplayer game like an MMO has for me um, to want to like to have any sort of self-motivation to play this. So if tomorrow you stop playing this game, I am not touching it. Like that's just kind of what? Yeah. Like, we're not really, you know, yeah. Like I play this game cause I want to play with you guys. And if, if that element is lacking, then I'm not going to participate because there's other things for me to do. Um, and so that's, I guess, my my main issue with Destiny. And a lot of that has to do with, around the systems that they have built with getting gear. And I know it's better, but to me, it's still not good enough. It's still too RNG-based. I, I want a Agreed. more a more progression, like a more clear progression path for me because it just, I can't, I can't deal with all the dice rolls. <laughs> it's, it's a frustrating part of the game for sure. And I've ranted several times about the way that RNG works with the microtransactions and how it's really frustrating to have to kind of put your progression in the hands of a dice roll. But I guess I'm just so used to that grind in Destiny that um, I just keep doing it. And a lot of that is because, you know, the gameplay loop is so fun. And really what that comes down to is Bungie's ability to make such a very smooth, well-designed first-person shooting experience. I am continually amazed every time I boot that game up and I play it, how great the guns feel how snappy the scopes are, how cool the combat is. And is it a little formulaic? Yeah, of course it is. A but little. I, but I had, <laughs> yeah, just a little. Um, I had a really <laughs> great conversation with somebody about how he, he really kind of walked me back from being mad about how they've reused so many art assets from the original Destiny because they're everywhere, right? And oh, yeah. we had a really nice conversation about how, you know what? Every game doesn't need to reinvent the wheel when they come out with a sequel. I mean, look at some of the tentpole franchises that exist. They have continually used some of the same art over and over again. And his point was, don't you think it's a testament to the world that Bungie has created that you walk into a level and you know if the Hive are there or you know if it's the Vex that you're going to be fighting or if it's going to be the Fallen. That they made those art styles and the the music and the the look and feel of those separate individual factions really recognizable almost instantaneously. And I was like, man, I never thought about it that way. Actually, you're kind of right about that because it's something that you take for granted when you spend so much time in a world that it becomes an expectation instead of something that you should appreciate. How do you feel about that, Steimer? I agree on the sense that, yes, it was, it's good of them. that you, Yes, you walk into an area and you can kind of get a feel for what sort of enemy is there. Their art style is great. The world, it looks beautiful. However, things... I will, and I'm, I will try to never, ever, ever in my life use the word lazy when it comes to development because I don't think that that is a word you should ever use. But I find it strange <laughs> that like when I was talking to you because I didn't play any of the DLC for Destiny 1. Um, and I was like, oh, are the, the Fallen? They're just like the same thing. And then you're like, well, kind of, but they move differently and they, their AI is a little different. Am I using that right? No, not the Fallen, the Taken. Sorry. Is that correct? Oh, yes. Yeah. So the, the Taken were introduced in the um, the final expansion, the Taken King for Destiny. And they essentially are different faction members who have been like um, abducted or taken. Their souls have been kind of um, stolen by this creature Oryx, this hive god. And... Um, so their outlines are kind of the same, but their movements and the way that they, be they behave are different. And I was like, okay, sure. <laughs> but then we go to Destiny 2 with the big fucking two, which I believe is exactly what they said yes. on their stage. Luke Smith did um, say that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and it's the Cabal. 
And I'm like, I already know these guys. Like, you could it, give me something new here. Yes, you get. And they and there's just so many things that I felt if you're going to, number one, drop the F-bomb. <laughs> number two, put a big, like, put an emphasis on the two and the sequel. I just still think that they needed more. They needed more upgrades. I don't think they necessarily needed more in the art department. Um, I think they needed more improvements on their gameplay systems. I think they needed... Uh, the, the campaign was fine. I have no real issues with that. But for me, I'm like, okay, this still feels too RNG. You didn't, re- you, you fixed like minor things. Like you fixed what you needed. The bare minimum, I guess, was what I would say. You fixed. Yeah. Um, well, I think the RNG problem could be solved by having the vendors have a better option of buyable goods. And that was a problem in original Destiny as well. So once you've hit level 20 and you're over power 200 the options for you to purchase good gear at higher levels is substantially reduced and it doesn't make sense to me to build a bunch of gameplay systems that are only beneficial during the early stages of gameplay on a game system that's designed to have you play the most in the late game so that to me is like there's a there's a giant piece of content missing there and going from like power level where you're at like going from like 200 to 250 for example Mm -hmm. and then going from 250 to 300 is another hurdle altogether so like i'm at power level 270 right now there is nothing i can buy from any vendor because everything is substantially lower than what's possible. And I'm just getting started in Destiny. I haven't even tried the raid yet. I'm looking forward to doing more of the strike playlist, to spending more time in Crucible. And I have all of this glimmer that once again, I have nowhere to spend, except if I want to spend it applying shaders to every piece of inventory that I own. But <laughs> <laughs> but <laughs> it, it, it doesn't feel right that you're using what, um, what I've heard someone refer to as the sweat currency of glimmer, like you, the, you run around the world and earn glimmer. Why can't I buy things with that? Uh, in, yeah. de- in previous Destiny, that you got tokens like Vanguard tokens, where you could go and buy higher level level gear. And right now, I just don't see that gear. And I'm hoping that they're going to add it in later. Um, they don't have to redesign the gear. They just got to make it. They just got to boost the level of it and make it worth buying. If I could spend every resource I I had right now to buy one piece of 280 level gear, just one piece, I would. I would yeah. wipe my coffers clean to buy one piece of gear and then have to put in hours to re-earn all of that currency again. But they don't have that as an option and that's really frustrating. That that was kind of my point earlier. Is like, I, I understand that they love their gambling and they love their RNGesus. Fine. <laughs> Pray to R and Jesus as much as you want, but give the people who don't want to gamble a way that will take longer, probably, maybe, depending on how bad your luck is, um, but is a more surefire way of getting the things you want. And the other thing I think is kind of weird is like, except for, I mean, I guess it's not that weird, but I'm used to MMOs and I'm used to the systems that they have. And I know that this is not technically an MMO. I just wish they would have taken more from an MMO and put it in this game. Um, because there's things, simple things like a wardrobe. Hey, anytime you have a piece of gear, you could you like save the look of that gear. Even if it's hot, low level, high level, whatever. Um, because I found some cool pieces and... I, I've actually like gotten rid of them because they ended up, you know, falling off the power level. And I know now that I can infuse them, but so I, I probably won't do that anymore. But I'm just like, man, it would be nice if I could. I'm obsessed with making my characters look cool, so I want to be able to mix and match. That's a gigantic outfits. part of Destiny too. Yeah. But is it? Is my question because I feel like they haven't built you anything to help you do that. Like I feel like the people should get a friggin' medal if you can make your character look cool in Destiny. Because I don't know how you're doing it. Because you, you, you can't, you can't, like, the, you have to look up on the internet. There's no way to look up in game the pieces that you want. You have to figure out which, what you can equip and what you can't because of power levels or exotic um, issues. Because I didn't realize, and this is a thing that's always been in Destiny. So this was just me having not played it in a very long time. Uh, but I got I had these really cool, actually, I think I still have them, um, exotic arms. And then I got a really cool exotic chess piece. And I was like, you can't have both. (laughs) And I was like, 
what? But I want to look cool. Like, <laughs> like, yeah, that's it's a bummer, but it's a gameplay balance thing because a lot except, of the exotics have really powerful perks. And here's my point to that. I'm like, why is there not just like a, a necklace slot or like a something else, like something that is not visible that is that high powered perk slot? So they had and that then, in previous Destiny. They, they had relics was the thing that you equipped that had a perk that increased your power level but was not visible on your character. And they don't have relics now. And I'm not sure why they took those away. Why you do that? Because then you can just do that there. And it doesn't, and then you can put all the pretty stuff on you. Yeah. Um, because the only solution I see now is you can take that exotic gear and tr- I always want to call it transmute because that's what it's called in other games, uh, but infuse a higher powered legendary with it. And then you can wear it because it will be now legendary and not exotic. But I'm like, oh my God, really? Like, <laughs> this is like really ass backwards in order to do this. And you also need to make sure that an infusing is also really um, not that common, is from what I can tell. Like, you need legendary shards. Shards, yeah. So they had to, they're trying to balance it out. And this is the frustration I have with this like middle part of destiny the grind from level once you hit level 20 going from like 200 power to 300 power is the part that's the most challenging and this is why i'm still upset about the shader business and Mm -hmm. i'm not going to go into my big rant about it i've ranted on on games daily several times and i ranted about it last week of the show but like the reason why it's frustrating is as a a destiny grind person i know how the grind works that means i'm going to be constantly dumping the gear that i get it means Mm -hmm. even my legendaries that i like the purples that i want to keep i'm gonna get that exact same gun or that exact same piece of gear in a higher power level at some point and then i've already applied the shader and so i either have to dismantle it and then reapply the shader or i have to spend shards to infuse it which means i have to dismantle something else to get the shards and it's the way that the economy works is just frustrating. Is it game breaking? No, I just don't know why they changed it's, it so fundamentally from what it was. It's not player friendly is what it, it's not. And I think that that's the thing that they really need to address because it doesn't make any sense. So like you're saying it's a gameplay balance, but I don't understand why looking the way you want to look is a gameplay balance issue whatsoever. Right. How, what does that have to do with gameplay? Like, or with, with balancing your stats? You already have the higher level piece. I just want to look this way. It is literally cosmetic only. What's the issue? Because they want to sell you loot boxes. Well, you know what? Too bad. <laughs> like, put cooler stuff in them and then I'll buy them. <laughs> yeah. I, but, and I, and I want to say, I appreciate all the people who've reached out to me explaining that, yes, Bright Dust allows you to buy individual things. You can buy a specific legendary emote a specific shader or a specific ship because tess's rotating inventory for bright dust will change i think we just need more time to see just how diverse her um her inventory will be but so far i haven't seen any exotics for sale i really am hoping that when zur returns and i believe he's going to be returning uh the day that this podcast goes live on friday the 15th that he's going to sell an exotic emote or the exotic ships or sparrows. Um, fingers crossed. <laughs> what, but I don't even I know what remember. kind of currency he takes because I haven't gotten any strange coins or anything yet. Right? I was about to ask what he takes because I couldn't remember either. Well, I haven't received any strange coins, so I'm not sure mm-hmm. if he's going to take Glimmer or if he's going to take Legendary Shards or if he's going to have a or brand both. new type of currency. Don't know. But if he's gonna, but he, they can't have him show up and be like, Aha, uh-huh, it's this type of currency none of you have earned yet because he's like, you can't, like, it's got to be something that you already have, right? We hope. <laughs> like, <laughs> that'd be so weird to be like, Zur is here, but none of you can buy any of his stuff because we just now added this currency to the game. Start earning. <laughs> like, <what>? Yeah. <gasps> you guys um, are mean. You're just mean. <laughs> well, yes and no. Yeah, this is why I'm so conflicted. I, I love Destiny 2. I'm having so much fun playing it. I want to be playing it right now, but. I I think that they made some missteps that could have made this game really excellent. And I hope that they are listening to the community and that they fix some of these small things. But that said, yeah. I really love this game. I knew I was going to love this game because I loved all of original Destiny. But um, Steimer, as somebody who skipped a lot of Destiny, are you 
are you really excited for the grind? Are you ready to put more time in? Are you ready to like, you know, do all of as, the stuff over again? As someone who has put 1,200 hours into Guild Wars 2, I am no stranger to a grind fest, right? Like I have, <laughs> se- that sounds really dirty, but I have like seven <laughs> level 80 characters. It takes infinitely longer to get to the level cap in Guild Wars 2 than it does in Destiny. Um... However, that being said, I think the thing that turns me off the most from Destiny is just the reliance on RNG. And because the gameplay itself, you're, you're right. It's super fun. I have a lot of fun when I'm playing with you. I love running around punching things in the face. It feels great. I love <laughs> shooting things. It feels great. Like all of those, it is not an issue with the core gameplay whatsoever. It is an issue with the systems built around that core gameplay loop that I have a problem with. And like, I just, I want them to fix it. And it's not even like, it wouldn't even take that much to me to, to fix these things like you just need to put in a few more player friendly systems it'll be okay it shouldn't break your economy if it does you built the whole game wrong so think about it <laughs> <laughs> get back to us <laughs> please let me know when you decide to not make your game entirely rng based and i know that then again like there's the thing i thought was cool although this is again sort of based on rng um i like that i finally got like a little note uh, or a quest line or some kind in my inventory for a gun. I don't know what kind of gun it is because I haven't really looked at it that much. But I was like, oh, I got one of these things where it, it takes you on a quest to get the gun. And I'm like, that's nice. Except, I don't, how did I get this? Don't know. Random drop. Like, it would be nice if, <laughs> if I could have picked, like, oh, there's, you know, I really want to get, because I tend to just use auto rifles or um, scout rifles. Like, those are the two kinds I really like. It would be you're nice gonna I... love the quest for the Midas multi tool, one of the best rifles ever. Cool. So I'm looking forward to that then. I'll tell you, Steimer, that's part of the thing that Destiny community loves about Destiny is this kind of puzzle puzzle part of it and figuring out where to go to do things and what the mystery is around the quest lines. And that was a really big part in original Destiny, and I'm glad to see it's back. I know it might be frustrating to you where you're like, I just want to go pick up the quest and then do the quest. But um, that's kind of a thing for Destiny is to like it's not just tell like- you how, how to get it. You just got to kind of figure it out. And I'm always impressed by how quickly the community figures this stuff out. Like there's a big Easter egg within the farm uh, with the commander's blessing. That's pretty cool. And uh, there was a on the comms quest that dropped that was about awaiting the world eater, which had something to do with the raid, which I'm sure by now somebody's figured out. Um, and that's kind of part of this part of destiny is being able to go and discover those things. And they don't kind of spoon feed it to you. I'm more of what it's not. I don't need it completely spoon fed, but I would like to pick or, or at least like, let me pick what kind of gun it is. Like, what if this is a stupid <laughs> sidearm? Like, I don't want the sidearm. I don't want to spend 30 hours getting a fucking sidearm that I don't want. Like, so it's more it's more about that. Like, I don't want to be earning something that I don't even care about, which for me is a lot of you things. You can totally abandon the quest if you don't want to. But I have to tell you, as somebody who did the Drang quest to get Sturm, I don't use hand cannons. But wow, that hand cannon is awesome. It's real yeah. good. Okay. So, like, well, I don't, I don't anticipate myself ever using Drang again, that golden sidearm. But Sturm, the hand cannon, that exotic <laughs> is real nice. So if you want to do that, I'll, I'll shepherd you through it. I will sherpa you, Steimer. Ooh, please do. Please do. Yeah, and I don't want to say, I know that I'm sounding super negative, and I'm trying not to. It's just more of like, I really, I want to, I want to wholeheartedly love this game. Yes. I would like to. I just feel like it makes it difficult sometimes. You're not wrong. You're not wrong to have a little salt about this, Salty Steimer. Oh, that's the one thing I want. I want that emote. The salt there's emote? A, there's, is, a, there's a salty emote. And I'm put like... Put some seasoning on it? Yeah, it's real good. Okay. <laughs> I'm like, that's... If there was ever a more me thing, come on. We'll, so, figure, out, we'll figure out a way for you to get that. But um, yeah. before we wrap up this talk, um, one of our awesome community members, Molly Bittner, who we talk about on the show Hi. sometimes, um, reached out to me because... Um, 
she was like, with all this Destiny talk, I have some really cool space news. So Molly works at Jet Propulsion Laboratories, JPL, which is, works with NASA on cool space stuff. And um, they have a program that's going to be airing on the Nat Geo channel called Mission Saturn. So it's live on Friday, September 15th, so the day the podcast comes out at 9 p.m. local time. So please check your local listings on the exact um, timing on that. Um, and and it's also there will also be a Saturn inside the rings on the Discovery Channel Canada, which is also airing on Friday. She said 7 p.m. Eastern time. But of course, check your local listing, listings. And what this is, is it's the um, entire end of the mission. Which, what is she saying here? It goes through the atmosphere. It will be streamed on NASA TV. So this is a actual NASA mission that is going to be on TV. Let me look up the exact details. Um, Simon, have you ever watched any of the, the NASA streams? Um, no, I've watched, um, not NASA, but I've watched like the Elon Musk where he launched the rocket and then landed it on a specific l- pad, like in the middle of the freaking ocean. Um, because my uncle actually is also very much into space. So, <laughs> uh, so anything space-wise, I too usually watch with him. So... To, for everyone who doesn't know about this, what it is is in August 2009, NASA's Cassini spacecraft became the first robotic emissary from Earth to witness an equinox at Saturn when the sun was shining directly on the giant's planet equator. So um, this Cassini spacecraft will send its last message back home as it plummets through Saturn's atmosphere until it is ultimately ripped apart. This, <gasps> death, this death dive marks the final phase of a 13-year mission exploring the ringed planet and its bevy of moons. So Cassini will beam back images until Thursday night, and it will keep pinging us with its position until the wee hours of Friday morning when its antenna will turn away from Earth for the last time. What if it goes goodbye forever as it dies <laughs> that would be amazing um, <laughs> but i wanted to give that a shout out because uh we're talking about destiny 2 and and saturn is um the dreadnought is in the ring of saturn if you guys ever played the taken king expansion so it's kind of a cool little tie-in um so if you guys are space geeks and you would like to check that out um thanks molly for letting us know about that um and um she said that they'll be live at 4 a.m uh, watching the death dive, and I'm like, well, the podcast is going up after that, so people will miss it, but uh, you can watch the archives, archive. I'm sure. Yeah. yeah, yeah, absolutely. So that's cool. Um, any final Destiny 2 thoughts before we go on to the last segment? Um, no. I'm going to pew-pew more with you later. Yeah, we're going to pew-pew it up, and we want pew, you pew. to pew-pew with us too. So I'm going to talk to um, some people in the community who are running our current... Um, what's good guardians clan and see if we can get a second clan set up since we maxed out our first clan so quickly. Um, if you guys want to set one up and you want to coordinate it with me, uh, please feel free to reach out to me, um, either on Twitter, on Facebook, you can email me at, um, contact at what's good And, uh, we can, uh, get something going there. All right. That is it for this week. I have a feeling we're going to be talking about destiny two again next week, but I'm going to do my best to play some other stuff for all those people out there listening going, uh, Can we please stop talking about Destiny? I know there will be other games. Um, All right, you everybody, we're going to take another quick break and we will be right back. Mm Mm-hmm. We chatty motherfuckers. Cool. That sounds fantastic. Hold on, let me... All right, we're good. Welcome back, everybody. Thanks for sticking with us here on the What's Good Games podcast. So we apologize. We missed the first couple of weeks of doing our September Patreon shout-outs. And um, we got a little bit tangled after coming from PAX West, so apologize to all of our amazing patrons who are out there at patreon.com slash what's good games, our turbo patron tier and above. So we are going to read those amazing names for all those people who um, do so much to support us. So here we go. Starting with one of our flagship sponsors, Take This. Thank you so much. We've also got Alex Rogopoulos, Lincoln Davis, Stephen Insler, Tom Bach, 
Misael Villegas. Villegas. Sorry if I said that wrong. Yeah, probably Kia Villegas. Bright. David Icolucci. Josh Kerwin. Eric Ginn. Eric Ginn. I never asked him how you say that. Eric, reach out to me. That's Is okay. it Ginn or Ginn? Let me know. I'm messing it up every month. Dustin Lewis. <laughs> Tara Bruno. Kyle Heyman. David Cook. Stephen McPherson. Aaron J. Saxon. Benjamin Pardew. Doug DeShazer, RJ Bryan, Elmo Shell, Carl Peterson, Molly Bittner, John Drake, Chris Rhodes, Simon D, Bill Stilwell, Jason Erickson, Sam Baptist, Danny O'Dwyer, Adam Rapone, Billy Shibley, Stephanie Fitzwilliams, Jason T. Barnes, Harrison Pink, Tommy Larson, Ross Haney, Mike Lynch, Anthony Murphy, Sheriff Stewart, Oswaldo Sandoval, Ethan Anderson, Gio Corsi, Greg Fletcher, Elijah Steele, Duncan Stanley, Marcus Brown, Material Addict, Devin Hansen, Joe Sh- Schleff, Schleif, <laughs> I'm gonna get Schleff. it, Annette Gonzalez, Christian Rodriguez, Troy, Grayson Moore, Louis Creech, Ron Mann, Donato Sinicho the third. I think Good I said job. that right. <laughs> Adam Boys, Lee Kendall, Jacob Hagardi, and my mama, Teresa Ener. I don't know how she always Aww. ends up last on the list, but I like that she's last. Um Thank you so much for supporting us and being part of our awesome Patreon community. We have lots of cool stuff over on that page. We've got Patreon exclusive videos. We have Patreon exclusive live streams and of course some cool physical rewards if you guys like getting stuff in the mail. Uh, If you guys have not yet uh, checked that out, please do so. And thank you to everybody who is listening and watching whether you're, you've subscribed on podcast services around the world, whether you are a YouTube subscriber, or whether you are watching this um, you know, on our Patreon page. We love that you guys are part of what we do, and we couldn't do it without you. So, Big thank thanks. You. We love you. Yeah. Um, so for this week's um, third segment, we're doing something a little different. I had the opportunity to um, speak with Kelly Wallach. Uh, the woman who is the big boss at the Indie Mega Booth. Steimer, you visited the Indie Mega Booth at PAX West. I did because Thimbleweed Park was there and also Monster Prom, which we all played together. It was excellent. So the Indie Mega Booth is a really cool thing that showcases independent game makers work where it, it puts a spotlight on games that you might otherwise never have known about or never would have seen. And I sat down with Kelly to talk about how the Indie Mega Booth started, the kind of work that they do, and really kind of picked her brain about it. So uh, we're going to go ahead and play that interview for you guys to check out. And um, we'll see you uh, on the other side. So enjoy. What's good, everybody? This is Andrew Renee for What's Good Games. I'm at PAX West 2017 here with Kelly Wallach. Kelly, I don't even think I know your official title. Oh, boy. Um, well, the very fancy official title is Overlord of Indie Mega Booth. That's um, the best title ever. <laughs> I sometimes go by Commanding Officer because I also love Star Trek and I just <laughs> I can't help myself. Um, technically, I guess CEO and founder. Somebody call me a Grand Puma. Puma? I'm into that, too. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. You have so the longest title, though, on a business yeah. card. You really got to make a small font. Yeah. I had a, a really funny picture from GDC one year after I took over the chairmanship for IGF, and I was trying to put that and Bit Summit and something else, and it basically, it just, the font was everywhere. It was just too, <laughs> too many things. I was like, okay, I'm just, I'm only going to put one on here. I got to edit this down just a little bit. Yeah. So, if you guys missed it, um, we she runs the Indie Mega Booth, which has been a staple of PAX conventions uh, for quite some time. Now, when was the first Indie Mega Booth? Yeah, so our very first show was PAX East of 2012. So it is wow, been, it's it been, has been that a long. while. I know, I know. It's getting pretty crazy. Uh, we're going on like five, six years now at this point. So, and that was, uh, there was a little bit of informal kind of like indie spaces prior to that. But yeah, the first officially branded Indie Mega Booth, PAX East 2012. That's awesome. So, when you guys launched, how many games did you showcase at the Indie Mega Booth? So, the very first one had 16 games in it. Um, That's mind blowing to think about how many there are now. There's about 85. Yikes. (laughs) And it was packed every time we went by there this weekend. So it's on the main show floor. I know previously it's sometimes been up on the sixth floor with some of the other smaller games, but there was never a shortage of people in the Indie Mega Booth. 
Yeah, and that was, I think, one of the, actually the whole reason that the idea and the concept started was that when the sixth floor had opened up and PAX West, they had a whole bunch of indie developers up there, and there was, I think, there wasn't a lot of traffic. It was kind of difficult to get notice. It's hard to get notice as an indie developer in the first place and then to be in a new area. Uh, and so then the PAX East the following year, we're like, okay, we're going to get a big, giant space in the middle of all the AAA stuff. We're going to get all the people we know in Boston to be a part of it, and then no one is going to miss us. You know, like, <laughs> you, you have to. You have to come here. <laughs> so there's quite a diverse offering of games inside the Indie Mega booth. Do you guys have any specific criteria for developers when they submit their game? Uh, yeah, so we, just as a little back history, we open up submissions twice a year. Um, so it's about every six months or so. And um, we do sets primarily around PAX East and PAX West, but we have smaller showcases inside of there. I actually wrote like a four, <laughs> like a four set blog post about like how we make selections and the curation so I've written like a 50,000 word essay on it but like wow. a, very, yeah, a very very short version is uh, we're kind of looking for three sets of a criteria one is the game one is the company and one is the presentation and game is obviously is the game good you know is it fun is it a neat is it game is it working does it, yeah. is it not broken yeah is it a yeah. game <laughs> you know is it a game question mark um, company is probably to me one of the most important ones and that means like are they contributing positively to the indie game development scene like are they younger and in need of mentors are they an established company that can help to mentor younger developers because a lot of what's important with the mega booth is not just that we curate games that are cool but that we want to help support the ecosystem of indie games in general and our community is really tight knit and I think part of it has been that we are very particular about like are they going to be a good fit are they doing something positive are they creating great things like where is this what, what can they do with what we give them with the resources um, and then the presentation side of it is like you know how how is it going to look at a convention? You know, like, do they have a cool idea? Like, do they have an arcade cabinet? Do they have costumes? Is there, do they read the directions? You know, is kind of another yeah, part of absolutely. it. Absolutely. Um, yeah. And then we, uh, and then we have a series of judges um, and then a smaller uh, group of people that make the final selections. And so there's a lot of factors that go into it. So there's not kind of like, one single thing unless you make a really good management sim and then I just veto everything <laughs> and it will go in. So if you make an amazing management sim, oh my God, please send it to me. So you've heard the secret sauce to getting into the indie yes. mega booth if you are a developer out there, make yeah. a management sim. So yeah. there's clearly, um, I mean, you must you must see so many different kinds of games, probably thousands of games. Yes. How many do you guys have to turn away? I mean, is, what's the ratio like? Is it like 30, uh, 70, 50, 50? Is it one of 10? Actually, 30, I'd say 30, 70 is actually a pretty accurate number. We get about. Like you maybe, turn away 70% of the games? Yeah, yeah. So it's about like, we get like maybe two to 300 games submitted per per around, I guess, and about like, yeah, 80, some of those make it in. But also we have kind of different um, areas in the mega booth. So there's main booth spaces, there's the mini booth, which is more like kind of turnkey kiosks. Um, and those are a little more for either less established studios or maybe uh, people that don't have the financial resources to have a full moon like booth space, or maybe it's a little weird, you know, and we're not really sure. <laughs> we're not really sure like what, so how it's going to go fringe. over. Yeah. Which are a little, you know, kind of my favorites. And we also have some tabletop games. So some of those numbers are not actual digital games. Um, they're tabletop games. So it's about, I'd say it's about a third per submission round. So sometimes I feel like I see the same games at the, at the mega booth. Is there like a time limit? Like once they've been accepted, are they allowed to keep showing their game for as many years as they want? Or do you kind of limit how much time they get? Yeah, so early on, we were just, this was before I kind of realized how many indie games there were. I mean, this was five, six years ago, too, so it wasn't kind of as prevalent, I feel like. You know, people were making them, but the the kinds of tools like Unity and Twine and stuff like that were just starting to kind of really pick up in the community at that point. Uh, and so we used to do it that everybody who is in before would just be in again automatically. Um, and then we started to have a problem where it was just like the same handful of games or development cycles take a long time. And then, you know, it's not interesting for fans in some case, but it also can be bad for the developer because, you know, it's, at some point, like you need to stop doing the play testing and you need to, you know, work on ship the, game. the game. Yeah, yeah. You need to ship the game. Um, and so we started implementing a three limit per game showing a policy and we started doing that maybe about a year and a half or two years ago and I think it's really really helped with that like if you look at this last PAX East and this current PAX there's a pretty high percentage of new content that people like haven't heard of before or teams that people don't know but there's still like I'd say about like a third or a quarter or so that are kind of like stuff that's already been there or established teams and so it's, it's actually really helped I think kind of rejuvenate um the like what fans expect when they come and see it what other developers are expecting when they come and see it as well. 
Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we were up in the booth the this morning, and we played Monster Prom. Oh yeah. Which um, you know we we went into we're going to talk about more on you know the regular show, but um, it's great walking through there and just seeing how different some of the games are yeah. and how unique they all are in the different art styles, the different yeah. uh, gameplay mechanics. What are some of the trends that you have seen as the person who clearly looks at all these <laughs> games um, and where the indie development scene is going? Is there a specific type of game that seems to be more popular? Um, so we, there used to be a little more kind of clearly delineate, like delineated phases where like we were getting all zombie stuff at one point or like at some point we got a lot of actually like, Oh my gosh, uh, so tired of zombie games. I know, I know. (laughs) But it was like, and some, and like after FTL came out, we got tons of space related kind of games. And so you could see influences like that. Um, I think one thing that kind of blew up a bit in the indie gaming sphere, but it's, it's hard is uh, local multiplayer games. And so those are, they're hard to, I guess, get out there and sell to an audience because they're, they're really fun at shows and they're really fun when you play them with your friends but like the amount of time that people get together and sit on their couch and actually physically play games with a bunch of friends is like kind of kind of low you know and it's a hard market to get into and so we've, we've seen a lot of those um, but I would say like over the last like year year and a half I feel like there's been less of like trends and more just kind of people I think trying lots of different stuff I think it's starting to be understood that you don't really need to chase after like whatever the kind of new thing is or like you know are you going to do mobile or are you going to do this or is it going to be zombies or is it going to be whatever and I think people realize that it's not so much like a formula anymore and so and there's a lot more room for creativity and there's other communities you know aside from us that help to foster like a consumer understanding of the variety and what games can be and so I haven't I feel like I haven't really seen a lot of like like trends per se other than like creativity which I really really like that's the best trend that you could ever ask for it's the number one trend yeah um so you've been running this for a while how did you get started with the indie mega booth like where were you before and how what led you to running this awesome enterprise uh, so I actually just did a panel about this um, this afternoon. It was called the Do It Yourself uh, panel, and it was the origin stories of how you got in the game industry. Because uh, my origin story is um, pretty interesting. <laughs> uh, so if you want to listen to that, that podcast at some point, but um, it's, so I went to school for chemistry. So I initially was working as a scientist, and so I worked at a nanotechnology company. Um, I got a job at Boston managing a chemical engineering lab at MIT. And then I loved it. It was like my favorite job. It was my dream. And then a steam pipe in the maintenance room next to our lab exploded during a testing. That sounds scary. It was, it was actually super scary. I was there like a half hour before it happened. And like, yeah, if I had been there, it could have been, could have been very, very bad. Um, they had a hard time shutting it off. It destroyed the entire lab. It basically like rained inside the lab for like six hours before they shut it off. Oh, no. Yeah. And it was just like, oh. And I went and I worked at a, a biotech company after that that was funding research in the lab. And then they screwed me over on a raise. And it was just all this stuff. And I was like, I don't know if I want to... I don't know if I want to be doing this. And so maybe it's time to look for a career change. Maybe it's time to look for something else. So I was going to start my own company. And then I had some friends at the time who were really into programming and wanting to learn how to make video games. And so I started going to local meetups in Boston. Um, And then from there, I met uh, my now ex-boyfriend, but he was running a studio in Boston. And so I started volunteering um, to help them do shows. Um, And then when the concept of the mega booth came up, I think I was actually still working as a chemist, like I was still working in a lab and I just wanted to learn more about the games industry. And so I ran all the organization and logistics for it since the very first show. And then eventually it just kind of took off and, um, I got a job working as, well, I started off as an administrative assistant and I got trained as a project manager to learn how software development works and game design. And, uh, I did that for the first two years that I was running the mega booth. Uh, and then eventually I just quit that and started it as its own full company. And it's been like, Three and a half, four years, we've been like a fully sustainable, like real grown-up company. <laughs> and now you guys, for the very first time this year, had your own standalone con. Yes. Yeah. So the tell mega me, show. Yeah. Tell me about the mega show. Yeah. So our very first one was in Atlanta. Uh, it was this past July. We held at a venue called the Tabernacle, which is like a really cool music venue there. Um, and basically, I mean, people have been asking us, like, when are you going to do a mega con or when are you going to do this um, for a while now? And what I really want it to be is like focused on 
local communities focus on its music, games, and art. And so we want to support local musicians. Um, we want to support local developers, local artists, and bring everyone together into basically kind of more like a like a celebration environment of games and a little less like a conference, you know, like we don't want to have talks. We're trying to reach an audience of people who might not really have exposure to a lot of video games or experimental stuff or arcade cabinets. Because um, I think a lot of the games and the stuff that we see done for shows like PAX is like, it's amazing and it's cool. It's arcade cabinets. It's all hardware controllers. It's interesting stuff. And I think for an average person who doesn't kind of like make a pilgrimage out to like a, a video, you know, capital V video game yeah. then um, would really connect with this sort of stuff. Um, and the kind of long-term goal with it is that the proceeds from the events will get shared out to the developers. Um, so it's a way to help to financially support um, small companies, they don't have to travel as far, uh, they can reach a local audience, and then they can get some playtests and get their game out there. And so the idea is that we go to multiple cities per year um, and just kind of do it as a way to raise amer- awareness in cities where there might not be a lot of tech and games, um, help out the local development scene, and kind of hopefully make this stuff more sustainable in the long run. That is so cool. I love that. Thank you. I, when I saw that you guys were doing it in Atlanta, I was a little bummed because I live on the West Coast. Yeah, yeah. But I'm sure it's great for people who, who were in that area because the East Coast it actually doesn't get as many of these yeah. video game conventions. So it was yeah. really awesome that you did that. But do you have plans to come to the West Coast? Yeah, we might. Maybe. Yeah, okay. Maybe. She's not spilling the secrets yet. <laughs> so, But don't worry. I'll follow up with yes, her. Soon. Um, so I would be remiss if I didn't ask you if you had a favorite game or two from the show here in Seattle. Yeah. I I know you probably can't play favorites. How about this? Instead of a favorite, maybe a game that I should go check out or maybe a couple of studios that you think I might not have heard of that I should look into. Uh, I like that. So I think, so my kind of like, it, not so much that it's my favorite, but because, like I said, I really like management sims. Um, there's one that I think is really interesting that's called Crest, uh, which is kind of like, do you remember Black and White? The no. Lionhead Studio game. It was like, wait, you were like, you played like a god, uh, like an animal creature god, and you had all these like people that were, you had to get more worshipers and all this stuff. And so this game is a little bit reminiscent of that, where you're like, you're a, a supreme god being, and you're trying to communicate with the people on the planet, and you do it through like essentially like a visual programming language. And so you like write out little like things on a tablet and like kind of give it to the people, and then they, you know, will follow your will or not or whatever. So I, I just personally think that that's like a very interesting concept. Yeah. Um, and I would say a studio it's a little more like an initiative and less of a studio is the girls make games program i don't know if you know anything about this i have heard about this so um so layla who runs it actually showed a game in the mega booth um, a few years ago she was working on educational games and then she became inspired to start um basically a, a summer camp for young girls to learn how to code and program and so it's for middle school and high school students and we've actually shown multiple games made through the games uh girls uh make games program uh so we have like groups of like 12 13 year old girls who have like made a fully functioning video game that have submitted that it is so and come and show it at PAX. yeah i wish when i was in school something oh like God. that had existed i know I the only summer that. camp i ever got to go to was soccer camp which yeah. don't get me wrong yeah. i had a lot of fun running around <laughs> and you know like scoring goals and things like that but nothing as interesting or as intellectually stimulating as as coding and programming yeah and i, I just think it's amazing so the game they're showing off is a uh, interfectorum which which I actually think is going to be available or is currently available uh, through the ID at Xbox program. Awesome. Um, yeah, so they, you know, worked on this game and made it from start to finish. And, yeah, and Layla's amazing. The program is great. And the girls are always, it's, I just love having them there. Like, what a great positive experience to have. It's like, I went and I made this thing, and then I came to this big, crazy video game convention and showed off my work and to people all these people played my game. It. Yeah, and people played my game, and they loved it. So, yeah. That is awesome. So, Callie, thank you so much for taking the time to talk with me. If people want to learn more about the Indie Mega Booth and about your mission, where can people go? Uh, so we are at IndieMegaBooth.com. Uh, we have a mailing list, actually, that we're going to be using to make some new exciting announcements in the next couple months. So if you want to keep up on what we're doing, sign up for the mailing list. Um, we're also on Twitter and Instagram. It's all Indie Mega Booth. Um, I'm personally Kelly Wallach on most stuff, but I'm not actually online all that often, so it's not nearly <laughs> as exciting. And you guys um, have some cool merch, too, that you yes, sell, right? Yeah, yeah. We're, I'm like, my secret goal is to like have a fashion line 
line and just stuff it into the video game industry and make everyone look cool because I'm just like... Well, the pins that you guys have here at PAX are really awesome and I scored a t-shirt which um, we'll be giving one of those away yeah. in one of our Patreon boxes. So, awesome. Yeah, you guys always have such cool stuff. You got the, you got the snapbacks yeah, too. Got yeah, we had leggings this time which I was saying I'm like... I know, I gotta yeah, go find them. I know, I know. We had for Atlanta our theme was like graffiti style and so they just we made leggings with this big crazy bright yellow graffiti on it which is awesome. <laughs> no, I love it. Well, thank you again so much. It yeah. was great to talk to you and we'll look forward to more information on when the next mega show is yes. coming and I uh, hope you enjoy the rest of your packs. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. Thank you so much again to Kelly for sitting down and chatting with me. She is such a lovely human being and we look forward to seeing where Indie Mega Booth is going to go next. I really love that they are taking the, the Mega Booth show on the road. Steimer, can you imagine if they brought a Mega Booth show to LA? How cool that would be? I mean, I would go. But here, my only, I like, I want it to be bigger because I think that that's one of the cooler parts of PAX. But it does get very crowded because I think more and more people are now like really interested in the Indie Mega Booth. So they need to start expanding their footprint, in my opinion. Well, I guess we just got to talk to Penny Arcade about giving them more space. But I do love that they're doing their own thing, too. And uh, we, of course, will keep tabs on everything that they've got going on and bringing it to you. But uh, that's going to do it for us for this week. Thank you, everyone, for tuning into the show. And again, if you guys have not yet subscribed or rated this podcast, we would greatly appreciate you taking the time to do so. And um, hopefully you all have a nice weekend.